Okay, I think we're gonna we're gonna go for it. So, welcome to the uh, to this Halloween special uh, special lecture. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Mike Wheeler. We've known each other for a, an awful long time. Um, I think I first met Mike in the mid 1980s, actually, at, at the University of Sussex, just after Mike's career in a, in a um, heavy metal band called Triarchy, <laughs> kind of almost come to an end. Um, this is something, the new wave of British heavy metal, you can look it up, I learned a new acronym, and uh, Triarchy was pretty big, but soon after I came to Sussex. Um, after being at Sussex, uh, you went on to Oxford, went on to Dundee, went on up to Stirling, I think may have been back and forth there at one point, um, and uh, is currently Professor of Philosophy at Stirling University. Um, Mike's distinguished in, I think, combining things that people don't often combine, which is a kind of analytic philosophical sensibility, a continental philosophical sensibility, and a cognitive scientific sensibility. So he's, you know, he's as at home with flying robots as with Heidegger. And there's not many people, I think, that, uh, that can say that. Um, today he's going to talk to us about the knowledge ecology, the past, present, and future of knowing with people and things. And I'm thinking this might be the, the new wave of British epistemology. <laughs> Maybe just starting here. So welcome, Mike. Thanks, Annie. Okay, thanks, and uh, thanks to the, uh, the knowledge. Uh, extended Knowledge Project people for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I treat this with a certain amount of trepidation given that I'm, I'm definitely not a card-carrying theory of knowledge kind of person. Um, so giving a talk that has some relationship with that kind of philosophy is, is, uh, is, is a bit frightening, but um, it's good to be frightened on Halloween. Uh, second thing is that um, in any lecture like this, which has the, the remit of a kind of public lecture, it's, it's important, I think, to, to try and take the ideas out of their kind of technical homes and to talk to people in a way that makes clear why these ideas are important um, and uh, connect up with our past, as I was trying to show, our present and our future of our relationship with technology. And I'm going to do that. There is a little bit just in the middle of the talk where I'm going to do a little bit of kind of uh, sort of straight philosophy. And uh, anybody who doesn't consider themselves at home in that particular intellectual uh, enclave uh, is welcome to sleep through that bit. Um, it gets lively again towards the end, so don't, uh, don't drop off altogether. OK, so here we go. This is our hero for the evening. Okay. Um, this is, well, this isn't a picture of uh, Calvisius Sabinus. Um, because, in fact, he was a very little-known uh, ancient Roman. Um, he was first generation of a freed slave. Um, but he is mentioned by Seneca the Younger. Um, and what Seneca the Younger, who really treats him with a lot of contempt, says about uh, Sabinus is that uh, he was a man whose reliance on slaves is so complete that he cannot even think for himself. He has bought slaves and has had them trained to memorise poetry so that he can be cultured while having nothing in his head. Okay? That's a quote from Seneca. And it does seem that uh, Sabinus was a wealthy Roman, lots of money, but had a very poor memory and thus compensated for that through the use of uh, what I shall later call memory slaves. And that's, I'm just going to leave that with you for now. All right? Because um, despite the contempt with which Seneca describes Calvisius Sabinus, I think he was onto something, and I'll explain why at a key moment in the talk. All right. So here's where we're going. As a cognitive phenomenon, knowledge is standardly thought of, I think both uh, by many epistemologists, but indeed by most people, um, as, as residing within the heads of individual human beings. Now, that, that little note as a cognitive phenomenon is important because, of course, we use the word knowledge to describe what we store in libraries and so on and so forth. Uh, but as a cognitive phenomenon, as something that we bear, uh, it's often thought of, as I say, as residing within the heads of individual human beings. So there's some knowledge being put inside the head of an individual human being. Pour it in, retrieve it later. Of course, sometimes we learn from other people, and that's when knowledge gets poured into our heads from other heads. Uh, and sometimes we learn from the internet. But even then, the thought is that it only really counts as our knowledge when we take it off the internet and somehow store it in our heads. And what I want to do today is suggest that this is a very poor picture of what knowledge is. Um, and 
Here's a quote from, uh, Andy nicely mentioned my sort of continental philosophy, here's a quote from the, the great German uh, philosopher, phenomenologist uh, Martin Heidegger, and although it's in a kind of standardly Heideggerian difficult language to understand, you get the point. This is one of my favourite quotes from Heidegger. In Being and Time he says, the perceiving of what is known is not a process of returning with one's booty to the cabinet of consciousness after one has gone out and grasped it. The idea of knowledge isn't something that, as it were, gets its status as knowledge by being brought inside from, from the outside into, as Heidegger puts it, the cabinet of consciousness. And I think, in the end, the image that I had on my opening slide is the kind of image that we want, that knowledge is, in a way that I'll try to be clear about as we go on, is something that, as a cognitive phenomenon, is distributed through people, multiple people, and the things that we use. So, obviously... Most likely, your first thought there is going to be modern technology. I just want to stress here that tonight I want to take a longer picture right, of things. Uh, as the ancient Roman at the beginning of our talk, who we'll return to, indicates, I want to get rid of, straight away, a kind of tempting image. And I, and I think it's important that we do that. It's tempting to think of our modern technological world, big data, mobile, wearable computing, social media, of, as this kind of world, as posing some kind of new set of opportunities and anxieties in relation to the nature and possession of knowledge. Uh, we think about issues to do with the knowledge that's in, say, Wikipedia and so on. Uh, we worry about big data. And, of course, these are, in some sense, genuine challenges. And in some sense, it's a genuinely new age of worrying about our status as epistemic agents in the world. But I want to suggest that the essentials of this picture have not really changed very much. And uh, boring a little bit here from, indeed, from Andy, uh, Andy, who's well known for the, the catchphrase natural born cyborgs to describe human beings as being naturally inclined to couple with technology. Um, I want to take up that kind of picture here in a kind of knowledge based approach. So it's our human nature, I want to claim tonight, to create and inhabit what I'm going to call knowledge ecologies socio technological contexts in which our knowledge is cognitively distributed beyond our raw organic intelligence. So through people and things. That my knowledge is distributed through other people and things. And when you say that, that as biological creatures, that's the kind of things we are, that we, our knowing is something that happens with people and things, that can sound really triv a trivial claim. But I want to make it into a quite, I think, quite uh, uh, radical claim, I hope, for many people, although not clearly for everybody in this room who's already come across some of these ways of thinking. And when I say the longer picture, I mean something like this. We can get excited about Google Glasses, but the way in which things like Google Glass expands, extends our cognitive capabilities, we just could easily put up an abacus. All right? It's of our human nature to couple with things in order to increase our, our cognitive performance. And if we worry about social world, where we can all join together with mobile phones uh, and so on through social media, well, even just today I was thinking about uh, 16th century Italian academies, where uh, people communicated to further and extend their ideas, and indeed used pseudonyms and catch names and things just like we do on, uh, on Facebook and so on. It took a bit longer, but the principles were the same. It was a kind of distributed social intelligence. Now, just a little note before we get into the sort of working through some of these claims and some of the, the fun examples and issues I hope to raise. Just a little relationship uh, question, uh, note about the relationship between knowledge on the one hand and memory on the other, because I'll use a lot of examples of memory in what follows. I think it's just intuitively uh, the kind of claim we want to make that most of what we know is stored in memory. Stored's in scare quotes there, because that's a complicated idea in memory sciences. But for tonight, we can keep it rough and ready. There's a sort of database in your head, and you store stuff in it. Uh, and you might think that, the, that, for philosophers in the room anyway, philosophy has often talked about the formation of justified true beliefs as being very important to our understanding of what knowledge is. A memory, you might think, is something like justified true belief maintenance rather than justified true belief formation. So you get some justified true belief and you want to make sure that's maintained over time and that's kind of what memory does. And that's one kind of intuitive way of getting a grip on 
the relationship between memory and knowledge. And clearly, if there's going to be memory knowledge, then the machinery of memory needs to be reliable. We need to be able to reliably depend on our memory to reproduce the right true beliefs, um, justified true beliefs at the right time. And, you know, if we're going to worry about that in terms of a, a picture where knowledge is stored in the brain, then we think very hard about the kind of neural mechanisms that maintain um, our memories. But a more interesting picture arises when we start to think of uh, external storage of information, uh, such that we're going to be engaged with various kinds of technology, and as we'll see later, other people, where information is stored in this distributed way and we access it. Can there be memory, you might think, which genuinely counts as my memory, but where the facts, if that's the way you want to think about it, are stored not in my brain, but in technology uh, and perhaps other people. And so here's a nice little piece of science to get us thinking about this. A few years ago, there were some nice experiments uh, by Sparrow and colleagues um, that were published under the title Google Effects on Memory, Cognitive Consequences of Having Information at Our Fingertips. And I actually think this research is it's great science because, it, in a sense, it just gives us the sort of empirical data for something we already knew. Right? So there's nothing surprising about this, but it's good to get the data. Anyone who's hung about people who care about technology will recognise this picture. So here's a sort of uncontroversial claim to kick us off. Given the availability of suitable technology, our organic brains will tend to internally store in the brain not the information about a topic necessarily, but how to recover that information using the technology. Right? And the classic example of this is how many mobile phone numbers do you remember now? Right? Okay, so you, do, you, you know you can get that information by using your technology. Remember in terms of internal storage. Now, the experiment that Sparrow and colleagues did was very simple. Just a couple of groups of matched subjects. And for one, in the first iteration of the experiment, the first thing they did was they told one group of subjects to, uh, to type into a computer uh, a bunch of simple facts that you could easily recover from the internet. You know, um, about trees and ostriches and all kinds of interesting things. But simple declarative facts. And that group, they told that once the information was typed into the computer, it would indeed be stored there. Then they took the other group, got them to type in a lot of similar facts, same kind of facts, but this time told them that the information would not be retained on the computer. Interestingly, if you also take some of these, these, these individuals and tell them to remember or not to remember using their brains the task, it has no effect on what they remember, right? Telling someone to remember something doesn't have any effect. What's interesting, though, is that the group that were told that the information would disappear from the computer actually remembered lots of the facts using their organic brains, and those that were told the information would stay on the computer just didn't. And then you do another iteration of the experiment where you take the group who were being told that the information would be available later on their computer, and you tell them where on the computer they can get it. And lo and behold, that's what they remember, where to find the information later, but not the information itself. Now, I don't think this is going to be surprising, right? I think that's kind of pretty obvious, but it's nice to get the data. What's interesting is that The Guardian, perfectly respectable newspaper, described the experiments perfectly well, reported the research under the heading, Poor Memory, Blame Google. That's the Guardian assuming, of course, that by memory we mean neural storage. Right? And the thought is your neural storage, which they're taking to be memory, is just getting worse because you don't remember facts anymore, you just remember where to find them. Actually, the experimenters themselves have a slightly more upbeat message. They talk about an adaptive use of memory in which the computer and online search engines should be counted as an external memory system that can be accessed at will. Now, even that isn't quite as specific, I think, as we want to ask. So here's the question that we want to ask. In such cases as this, do we know the facts? So a case where what you're doing is you definitely know this much, right? You definitely know how to find the facts, right? You know where to look on the computer. Or, you know, if we go back out into the ordinary world as we think of it now, we know the website to go to, right? We know which clicks to go through. We definitely know that much. But is that all we know in these cases where it appears we can't recover the information from our poor old organic brains? 
Or do we also know the facts? Is there any way in which we can tell a story in which what we ought to say is that you know perfectly well the facts, right? even though the information is stored externally? I think there are cases in which we want to say that, and we'll get that to them. Now, here's a little bit of terminology. I'm sorry, that we have to be just a little bit of terminology because it will help us later. People in the area who care about these kind of issues uh, often make a distinction between what they call embedded cognition or the embedded mind on the one hand and what they call the extended mind or extended cognition on the other. And the embedded cognition theorist still thinks that the only... If you've got one of these extended systems in the sense of you've got a brain, you've got some physical movements of your hands, you've got, say, a little bit of mobile computing and then lots of information stored on a server in China. So it's a nice distributed system, right? Spread out physically all over the place. And what the embedded theorists will say, it's really interesting because your cognitive performance, the things you can do now, might be expanded in all kinds of interesting ways. You might be able to, for instance, if you just go to a simple case of a calculator, do sums you couldn't do with your poor old naked brain. Right? And that performance is definitely enhanced by using technology. But what the embedded theorist wants to say, that's really interesting and really important, and psychologists should care about that, because we are the kind of creatures that couple with technology in order to get increased cognitive performance. But the real thinking, that just goes on in the brain. That's the only bit of the system that actually thinks. The rest, as the embedded theorist will say, is scaffolding that helps your poor old brain get to some more interesting results. On the other hand, the extended cognition theorist is a lot more gung-ho about these things, you might think. The extended cognition theorist goes, no, 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 the thinking, that takes the actual thinking, the actual thinking, takes place in a system that's spread out over your brain, your bodily movements, and the bits of technology that you're using. Possibly part of your memory stretches as far as a server in China. Okay? Now, I think that has to be true, actually, although it's a kind of claim that most people find a little bit, nerv a little bit nervous about, and if someone else, of course, famously has defended this sort of view. Although well, maybe not you know, in the, sometimes the examples that we might want to use to push, push the issue, uh, we, you know, we might draw back from. But nevertheless, nevertheless, these are, these are cases that uh, we definitely, the thought is there are these cases of extended cognition. Won't worry about that because that's not needed for today. And, of course, Andy introduced, along with Dave Chalmers, one of the most famous examples of this in the literature. The killer example for many, in the sense that it's been the subject of an enormous amount of philosophical and scientific debate since. And it's good that this has entered the literature. And this is the case of Otto. Now, I'm going to go through the whole thought experiment. Otto is an imaginary individual who has a, a kind of selective form um, of cognitive uh, problem in which he can't retain certain kinds of declarative facts in his brain. So, for instance, the example goes, um, if, him, if Otto forms the desire to go to, to use the example, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, what Otto's brain can't produce is the information that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street. To compensate for that kind of worry, what Otto has done is store the information that he needs in a notebook that he's got completely expert at using. All right? He will effortlessly pull out the notebook when he's asked. You walk up to Otto and you say, where's the Museum of Modern Art? He'll effortlessly reach for his book. He'll find the information really quickly. He'll tell you the answer. He doesn't have any critical relationship with it. He doesn't worry about where the, where the information comes from. He's completely closely coupled with his notebook. Now, in the original example, um, won't, won't say too much more about the details of this, but the general thought is that Otto, or perhaps Otto and the notebook system, is the bearer of a kind of extended memory, literally extended memory. Part of Otto's memory uh, is in the notebook. It can't be his whole memory because he needs access systems and there's, they're in Otto's brain and in his, in his bodily movements. But, as it were, the information that forms the content of the memory, the location of the Museum of Modern Art, that's in his notebook. But that's literally part of Otto's memory, if the extended cognition view is right. And with some, some philosophical points I won't worry about tonight, there's also an extended belief. Now, if we say that Otto's belief here, or his memory um, uh, is accurate, or if we say his belief is true and justified, or whatever else you want to add in for something to be needed, whatever's needed for knowledge, then what we could say is that Otto, or the Otto notebook system, has knowledge. The thought is Otto knows where the Museum of Modern Art is, even though in this, this system we have a bio, an organic part that's coupled with uh, an external uh, piece of storage piece of technology. Of course, the embedded theorist won't have that, right? What the embedded theorist wants to say, and this is just like the Google memory case, 
What the embedded theorists want to say is that prior to looking in his notebook, Otto has no such belief, no such memory, and no such knowledge. What Otto knows how to do is to find out the piece of information he wants by looking in his notebook. What he doesn't know is where the Museum of Modern Art is. Otto doesn't know the facts, but rather how to find them, just like the individuals in the case of Google Memory. Now, I think the intuition here, there's a kind of intuition which the philosophers will, will see as an internalist intuition, is why? Well, because the relevant information isn't stored reliably in his brain, right? The information is stored in a notebook. Imagine a case where Otto looks in his notebook, right? And, and so, you know, we can imagine there's some special event. And now suddenly Otto's brain starts to work such that he now stores the information in his brain quite comfortably, right? A miracle cure from somewhere uh, just in that moment. I think that many people's natural intuition would be to say that Otto didn't know where the Museum of Marden Art is, but he does now, right? Okay, assuming that information stays reliably available, that is, if his memory is reliable. Now, you might think that's just begging the question against the extended mind, but I think there's a truth in this that we need to get back to, and we'll come to it in a moment. Here's another example that's always nice for pushing these intuitions uh, from John Hoagland. And uh, given my musical past, I will sing it. Do you know the way to San Jose? Right, now... Uh, the answer, we might think, uh, is interesting here because what John Hoagland says is there's two different methods by which you might get to San Jose. You could consult an in-the-head stored map of the route, right? Or you could just select the right road and follow the signs. Okay? Now, here's what Hoagland says about, the sec about these cases when we compare them to each other. Much as an internal map or program learned and stored in memory... Right, by which he means the brain, would have to be deemed part of an intelligent system that used it to get to San Jose, so the road should be considered integral to the ability. Now, note this is it's quite interesting. Something about this is, 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 is very subtle. The comparison here is with a map. And the thing about maps is they tell us where things are. They tell us their location. So the thought here is that the road is considered integral to the ability, but I think the road, if it's just like the map, needs to play a part in a system where the person who just gets on the correct road and follow the signs knows where San Jose is, right? knows the location of San Jose. So now we can ask the same sort of questions we asked in the Google Memory case and in Otto's case. Is it that my knowledge of where San Jose is is located... It, sorry, is it that my knowledge of where San Jose is located is stored partly in the road? Or is it that all I know is the name of the right road and how to get onto it? If you're an extended theorist, perhaps of a quite radical time, then you'll, sorry, you'll answer yes to this one, right? Well, if you're an embedded theorist, you might well just say yes to this one. Of course, it's very interesting that we, we, we couple with the road and that gets us to San Jose. That enables us to do something we couldn't do if we didn't couple with the road. But look, you know, seriously, all you know is the name of the road and how to get onto it, right? You don't know where San Jose is. Whereas a quite a radical extended theorist might say, well, no, it's just that part of your knowledge is embedded in the road. You know where San Jose is. Okay, and how you fall on that might make the difference between being an extended or an embedded theorist. Now, at this point, I'm going to do something that I've never done before, which is talk about epistemology for a couple of minutes, right? Um, uh, so, because I think these cases are really important when we start to think about knowledge uh, and how we think about it in, the in, in a world where, although it's not a new world in sense of its essence in terms of our relationship with technology, we're worried about it in a way that we probably weren't in previous uh, centuries. There's, a, there's a, a view of knowledge out there which I think is very intuitively plausible and a lot of philosophers think it's the right, the right view. And there are various versions of this that come out in various ways. <laughs> The so-called credit theory of knowledge. And a philosopher would put it like this. Knowing that P, where P is some proposition, implies deserving epistemic credit for truly believing that P. Well, that's the way a philosopher will put it. Um, what we might say is knowledge is believing the truth because of the correct application of one's own cognitive abilities. Right? So you deserve credit because your own cognitive abilities are implied in the fact that you believe the truth. That's the basic idea. You get credit. And here's Sosa um, putting that view nicely. Belief amounts to knowledge when its correctness is attributable to a competence exercised in appropriate conditions. And that's the idea. So, if you exercise your cognitive abilities in the right way, that produces a true belief. You get the credit, and that counts as knowledge. Okay, now. 
Interestingly, this produces a plausible attribution of knowledge in some of the really interesting embedded cases. So I don't know if this example is true, but we were, Andy and I were at a conference in Paris where we were told it as an anecdote by people who we sort of trust. So I think it might be true. So Chris Messina, who some of you will know invented the hashtag for Twitter, right? Smart, okay? Chris Messina apparently one time was having his car fixed. Right? So he went in, and out comes the mechanic. A lot of people would have been through this. Out comes the mechanic and says, you're going to need one of these, and it's going to cost a lot. Right? Now, Messina is in an interesting position, right? Because being the inventor of the hashtag on Twitter, he's got a lot of Twitter followers. Right? And also, given who he is, there's a lot of his followers on time, on, online at any one time. What Messina did was got onto Twitter, asked the question, you know, What's one of these? So do I need it under these circumstances? How much should I pay for it? And literally, if the story is true, while the mechanic was out the back doing something else, Messina had got enough information from his mass of Twitter followers to, to, to know that he was actually being treated fairly. So the idea is that what Messina has done is done some real-time crowdsourcing of car repair information using Twitter. Smart, right? And, and we can say Christmas Cena knows a fact now that he didn't know before. But why do we say that? Well, it seems, right, without giving, you know, I'll say this again in a moment in a different way, but it looks like what we're, what we're saying is Christmas Cena has sourced this information. At which point does he know it, though? It's when he knows it, when he kind of pulls it into his own mind, if you like, into his brain, right? It's that idea of bringing the information into the, what Heidegger called the cabinet of consciousness, if you like. It's that moment when we talk about what Messina himself actually knows, right? Prior to, as it were, that information entering his brain, even though that information was readily available for him using the technology that he's got, the intuition is he doesn't know that fact about car repair. Think about the way we form true beliefs as a result of, of course, but of course, Messina's using cognitive abilities here, right, of course, uh, in, a, in a clever way. Forming true beliefs as a result of consulting Wikipedia, right? Uh, looks like we're using some cognitive abilities here. You know, if you just, you know, randomly surf Wikipedia and believe everything that comes up, maybe that's not really using your cognitive abilities, but, you know, use a little bit of sense. You know, you can give a justification, perhaps, about why you generally believe Wikipedia to produce true information, or if you don't like that example, pick a site that's less prone to nonsense than Wikipedia. You know, you can give a story about why it's a reliable site. You look there for the information, you get some information, you take it into your brain, and it looks like, you know, there's a certain amount of knowledge there and a certain amount of credit. And I'm going to come back to this case that it's very important that we see here that there's a transition where the information comes inside the head of an individual human being. But note that I think that the credit view of knowledge can give the right kind of answer in these cases. Now, the epistemologists in the room will know there's a very famous kind of counterexample to the idea that knowledge requires credit of this kind. And it's uh, Lackey's visitor case. So Lackey imagines this case where um, you just turn up in some town where you haven't been before, and you go and ask someone where some famous landmark is. Right? And they tell you, turns out to be true. Uh, looks like, um, Lackey says, in this case, right, in this case, um, you're not using enough, as it were, of your sort of cognitive abilities, right? So it looks like in the Messina case and in, in the website case, as long as you've done enough cognitive work yourself, you get to count as knowing, right, once the information's brought into your brain. But Lackey's point here is that it looks like, and, that, and that's because you've got credit, right? But Lackey's point is it looks like you've got knowledge here, but without credit, right? You've just asked someone who happens to be in the... In, the, in, say, a, a, a railway station, right? And Lackey's thought is that you certainly know now where this landmark is, because it turns out to be true, and you've, you've got it now as a true belief. But Lackey's thought is that you really haven't here got the credit, right? You don't deserve the credit for this. And the idea is supposed to be that it's your, the passerby you asked who, who really deserves the credit, if you like, here. They're the ones who've got a history living in a town, say, you know, you were sort of lucky, right? If you just asked, could have asked someone who didn't know at all what was going on, but, but you've, you know, you've asked someone who it turns out has lived in a town a long time, they've told you the truth, you've picked up a true belief, and you just don't deserve the credit for it, though. Of course, you know, we can imagine cases where you do get the credit, you do loads of research, you know, about the right kind of person to ask, and you work really hard at making sure you don't ask the wrong sort of people, then, of course, you're doing enough work to get some credit. And maybe then uh, the credit theory of knowledge delivers the right result. 
But it looks like, Lackey thinks, in this kind of case, you get knowledge without credit. Don't worry about that. Now, interestingly, Lackey also argues that the visitor's environment here is suited to the formation of true beliefs. But this has nothing to do with the epistemic effort, vir effort virtues, or faculties of the respective subjects. And hence, it has nothing to do with whether they deserve credit for their true beliefs. So, it is true that you could say that she's in a, this person who asks the passerby uh, for information about where this particular landmark is, is in a very sort of epistemically beneficial environment, right? There's a lot of people there who, who are likely to tell the truth, but it's still true that she hasn't done the work to get the credit. Now, this, this idea of epistemic credit and whether you can have knowledge without it can actually come into the sort of technology extended cognition kind of debate in an interesting way. Ken Ozawa, in a, in, a, in a recent paper, gave us the example of Otis, right? Otis is a student and he's a complete slacker, right? Otis doesn't go to class. Uh, Otis doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do any kind of uh, interesting studying at all in the evenings. He's, down, he's out down the bars enjoying himself. But when it gets near the exam, what he does is he works really hard at making a little note system for himself that he smuggles into the, using the textbook for the course, and he smuggles that into the exam, and in a very sort of clever way, he secretly consults it during the exam, and he gets a really good result. He gets a 92. The teacher discovers this and challenges Otis with it, and Otis explains what he's done. He said, look, you know, uh, I, I got the textbook, I copied out lots of information, I put it in this card system, I secretly consulted it during the exam, I got a 92, what's your problem? And of course the teacher says, you're a cheat. Fortunately, Otis has read some Clark and Chalmers, right? And Otis points out, right, that the information in the notebook system plays exactly the same kind of role as the information in Otto's notebook, right? Um, it's been reliably set up, he's coupled with it in a, in a perfectly uh, 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 reliable way, he doesn't question the information in any critical way, it's just like Otto and his notebook, right? And if we think Otto knows where the Museum of Modern Art is, or has a true belief about where the Museum of Modern Art is, then, you know, basically Otto says, look, it's part of my extended mind, you've got to pass me, right? Well, the tutor says this, because the tutor's not very impressed with the extended mind. The tutor's kind of a bit of an embedded theorist, right? So the tutor says, yes, yes, very clever, right? Your overall performance using your notebook got an A. But your overall performance didn't involve the cognitive capacities that were the subject of the test. That's why you fail. And what it looks like, the tutor is saying, is that Otis deserves some credit, right? He certainly set up the notebook system, but it's of the wrong sort, right? because it didn't test the cognitive capacities um, that were, that were uh, the subject of the test. So, so the, what I'm trying to get at here is that this relationship between credit and knowledge is complicated. There's cases where we clearly have the credit for knowledge, and, and that's because uh, the credit that will be required for knowledge by the credit theory, and that's because we use our cognitive capacities in, in normal ways. Um, there are cases where it looks like we might have knowledge but no credit, the sort of lackey cases, but there are certainly cases where we get some credit but it's the wrong sort, right? Uh, and, and the Otis case is like that. But what precisely is going on here? So here's the last case of this credit stuff, and then we'll see what's going on, I think. So in the extended knowledge literature, quite early on, there was this paper by Vason, um, uh, known as the sissy case example. It's the last one of these kind of credit examples. So here's the example. The idea is that airport baggage inspectors using x-ray scanners get bored really easily. But someone is onto this, and what they've done is they've fitted scanners recently in the airport that have a false positive engine which keeps the baggage inspectors alert. So what happens is that uh, something like this picture will come up on the screen, and the baggage inspector will press on the, uh, on the item in question, and if it's a false positive, then of course the, the machine will tell them so, right? And the idea is this false positive system just keeps the baggage inspectors much more alert. Now, Sissy is an inspector whose career straddles both types of scanner, and she inspects a bag containing a weapon. So she, she sees the image on the screen, it's genuinely a weapon, she clicks on it, and you might think that what's going on here is that she's formed a true belief regarding the contents of the suitcase on the basis of what she sees from the scanner. But of course, the explanation for this, at least some people think, is that 
the credit for this doesn't really sit with Sissy, right? Her cognitive capacities haven't changed since the old scanner, right? Not in uh, kind of organic ones. What's happened is that the machine, the false positive machinery, is, has kind of made Sissy extremely vigilant. Right? So the credit here either goes to the machinery or to the designer of the machinery or something like that. Yet, we want to say, of course, of course we want to say, that Sissy's got knowledge. Right? Sissy knows there's a gun there, right? but she doesn't deserve the credit. So this was supposed to be another way of attacking the credit theory of knowledge. But here's something interesting. right? The, it's interesting, it struck me immediately as soon as I saw this example. The Sissy example is an objection to the credit theory of knowledge, only if it's an example of embedded cognition. Right? Not if it's an example of extended cognition. If it's a case of extended cognition, then given certain circumstances about the way the false positive scanner is, is, is integrated into our ordinary thought and behaviour, then that technology, like Otto's notebook, right, and so on, if the extended cognition theory is right, becomes part of CIS's cognitive system. So the technology counts as a genuine part of Sissy's cognitive system. So extended Sissy, Sissy plus the false positive technology system, organic Sissy plus the false positive technology system, not only counts as knowing about the weapon, she does so on good credit theory grounds, right? Because the epistemic success is an achievement of an extended cognitive system, her, now Sissy plus the technology, which she includes that technology, right? So if, if the extended cognition view is right, and this is a case of extended cognition, then Sissy has knowledge and she deserves the credit, or at least the extended Sissy system deserves the credit. So now it's no longer an objection to the credit theory of knowledge. It's just credit theory of knowledge run under, under extended conditions. And this points us in the direction of something that's really interesting about what it tells us what having the right sort of credit is. And it's something that Calvisius Sabinus almost understood, right? So now we need to know a little bit about, more about our Roman hero. And I'm very indebted to Bill Short for, who alerted me to a lot of this stuff. So this example of memory slaves, it's going to seem like a tangent this, but in fact, this is, you'll see, this is, this is absolutely critical. If there's one sort of message in the talk, it's really this, coming up through this. So memory slaves cropped up in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome. Hellenistic Greek mythographers describe mnemones, rememberers, who were assigned to certain epic heroes to remind those heroes to perform or usually not to perform some action. Right? So uh, the interesting thing about this is that in this epic literature, the commentaries on the literature, the memory slaves almost always fail. Right? They're kind of ironic figures. Nice example, um, uh, Protesilus, uh, was foretold that if he was the first person off the boat at Troy, he would die. So he got a Nemo to remind him not to be the first person off the boat at Troy. Unfortunately, the Nemo doesn't provide that information because the Nemo gets killed. Protesilus comes off the boat first at Troy and gets, gets killed. Um, Achilles uh, was told clearly that he mustn't murder Tenes, right? Uh, he was a favourite son of Apollo, I think. Uh, so Achilles, and that because it would all go very badly for him if, that, if he did, so uh, he would die some horrible death. So he got a Nemo, who was actually called Nemon, that was one less thing to remember, uh, got Nemo, and got his memory slave to absolutely be clear to tell him not to murder Tenes. The memory slave forgets he murders Tenes, actually then Achilles murders his memory slave as well. It's a rough world, right, being a memory slave. So these are kind of in the epic poems. But actually, in, as it were, real ancient Greek and Roman life, there were similar figures. Nomenclators were Roman slaves charged with memorising details of social etiquette for their masters. They remember the correct way to address people, the positions of people and so on, so that um, people didn't, uh, you didn't, the masters didn't perform social faux pas. And that brings us back to Calvisius Sabinus, who had a very poor memory, as you'll believe, but was very rich. And he wanted to show off but he was not going to be able to remember great long swathes of epic poetry. So he got a team of memory slaves to commit to their organic memories poetry that they would recite on demand at dinner parties. And that's what attracted the viciousness of Seneca's uh, tongue. Now, this is the important point. The text suggests 
that as far as Sabinus was concerned, if one of his slaves knew something, then he knew it too. He, got, he took the credit, as far as he was concerned, for anything his slaves did. Now you might think, that can't be right, okay? Sabinus doesn't deserve the credit for it, right? It's a good case for using credit theory of knowledge in this kind of thing. He doesn't deserve the credit, his slave deserves the credit. Of course he doesn't know those poems. But Sabinus was onto something, right? Because Sabinus had a very clear theory, right? Ownership of the relevant cognitive processes is necessary for epistemic credit. Right? He owned the slaves. He owned their cognitive processes. They were his. Now, I think he was nearly right. Okay? He just got the wrong kind of ownership. Right? But he was onto something. Because ownership is exactly what needs to be gone. I think this has not been fully recognised uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the literature on this. Think about Sissy. Right? To get the epistemic credit, Sissy needs to own the false positive technology, which doesn't mean buy it, right? Okay? You, know, you don't get to, to know something just because you buy the technology. But in some sense, that technology needs to be part of her. She needs to own it. And that's necessary for credit. That's so obvious right, that nobody bothers to point it out. But actually, it's crucial when we come to the question of extended knowledge. So what do we mean by ownership in these cases? Mark Rowlands in The New Science of the Mind suggests the following. Now, this is a much stronger claim than I want to make for retails that things, reasons we don't need to worry about. Rowlands suggests that if a process is to qualify as cognitive, it's got to belong to or be owned by a subject. Right? And you might think, well, you know, what, what's going on there? How do we understand this notion of a subject? This isn't kind of circular with respect to ownership. You say it's got to be owned. You say what that means is being owned by a subject. You might think, well, that's kind of circular. You know, we want, we want more in the story than that. Actually, also, it's not clear... This is just for the philosophers in the room. We, we don't need to hang about on this. But um, there's quite a lot of work in, in phenomenology, in Heidegger's work and so on, suggests that a lot of times that, that cognition's going on, there isn't really a subject present. Cases like this involve uh, uh, cases where you're working, say, on, with a tool. Um, you want to say there's kind of cognition going on, say you're hammering, to use Heidegger's example. And the idea is that in the, in the kind of understanding we have of that event, certainly as far as your conscious experience is concerned, you're not really present as a subject, as it were, over and against a world of objects. It's like the, the distinction between you and the world is sort of broken down. The experience is just of the fluid, in-the-zone activity of trouble-free hammering. And you might think a good evidence for that is that if the hammer then breaks, suddenly you find yourself separated from the task and you, you sort of appear as a subject, fully blown subject over and against the world. So you might need to make sense of ownership without a subject. For those reasons, I don't like Mark Rowland's uh, uh, view here. Won't do that because of for time. I think here um, we just need to think about this in a very kind of so sciencey driven way. What does it mean to own something? Here's Rob Rupert. He takes what he thinks to be an empirical, empirically motivated account of ownership. He says, the self is the cognitive architecture, and it owns a state just in case that state is a state of one of the architecture's component mechanisms. And in fact, uh, Mark Spreeback and I uh, have had a little uh, spat in the literature over uh, the issue of uh, a little example that Mark had about a desktop Mayan calendar program and whether that could be counted as part of your cognitive architecture. Um, the details of that don't really matter. The point I want to make is that for, for, for something like a program on a piece of technology to really be part of your cognitive architecture, it looks like it's got to be functionally integrated into your architecture. That's the first claim, right? It's got to be, as it were, seamlessly part of the sets of processes and programs that, that make up your, your, your mind. And somehow, if it's separated from that, it doesn't really count as part, a part, of, as a, as part of your cognitive process. And most importantly... I don't think along, Roland seems to want to make that a condition for something being cognitive. I'm not worried about that. But this is what it's to be your cognitive process, right? So it needs to be functionally integrated alongside all your other processes and states. Uh, and what I think we need to see in this kind of example is that that's the kind of story that the extended mind theorist is going to have to tell to get the ownership condition right and therefore to get things like Sissy's technology to count as part of her cognitive architecture, right, such that she owns the technology in the right kind of way, and thus to get credit for what she does, okay, what she believes, and, and, and thus to have knowledge. So if we run the credit theory of knowledge with the extended mind, we have to solve the ownership problem. 
Credit theories of knowledge, I want to say, are in the right ballpark to present to produce properly extended knowledge, knowledge that's distributed through a technology or, or whatever, as a cognitive state, only when the ownership condition is met. And I think where the putative extension is via technology, I think this will deal with the Otto, Opie and Sissy cases, then this idea of functional integration provides an appropriate criterion. And of course we can argue about when that criterion is met or not, that's a separate story. What about cases where the putative extension is social, sort of memory slaves? Can we really say that Sabinus' memory slaves were kind of integrated into his cognitive processes in such a way that they counted as his, and thus part of his extended mind? I think there's a real problem here. Right? Uh, other people in extended mind literature don't think so, but, but in this kind of case, I think, I think there is a problem here. Um, you might think the problem here is there's multiple centres of agency, right? Just like Achilles' slave who failed to remind him at the right time, probably because he was off doing something else or became distracted or something. Where you've got multiple centres of agency, it's, there's a question about whether you think perhaps the idea here is that you might have functional integration, but where there's another centre of agency, somehow there's a problem. Or more likely, you might think that where you've got more than one centre of agency, you just can't have this kind of functional integration. So maybe ownership of the full processing loop isn't possible where the, the external system is another person. Or indeed another agent, right? It doesn't have to be a person. It's my favourite example of two centres of agency, uh, meaning that you can't have a kind of smooth cognitive process that's owned by either of them. This is from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, and this is where Zafe or Beeblebox comes into contact with an elevator made by the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. Uh, and this is what happens. Uh, the elevator says to Zaphod, I go up or down. Good, said Zaphod, we're going up. Or down, the elevator reminded him. Yeah, okay, up please. There was a moment of silence. Down's very nice, suggested the elevator, help, hopefully. Oh yeah? Super. Good, said Zaphod. Now will you take us up? May I ask you, inquired the elevator in its sweetest, most reasonable voice, if you've considered all the possibilities that down might offer you, right? Now, what we have here is a case where we've got two centres of agency discussing something. And I think this kind of case, you're never going to get a case where, as it were, we can have one cognitive process owned by one of these individuals that's distributed over the two. Right, so I think these social cases are much harder. And it's not just about human beings, it's about any other centre of agency. So if we made very, very smart smartphones, right, with such that we had the kind of technological singularity in place, and your smartphone was just like the elevator, then I think you wouldn't have an extended mind through your, through your iPhone. And that would disrupt cases of extended knowledge as well. Right? So that's, that's something that sets me apart from some of the extended mind people. All right, last five minutes. This is where we get onto stuff about education, right? So we've had the past and the present, right? I want to now look at the future. Here's a question I want to ask. What and how should we be educating in a world in which the skill of being able to find in real time the right networked information is increasingly more important than being able to retain such information in one's organic memory? Right? Back to the Google memory case, if you like. This is kind of a more technologically advanced OP, right, from Ken Izawa's example. Well, here's an example. Actually, Andy suggested this, this particular example to me, which I really like, so I've, um, I'm now using it. Uh, here's something you might say. So we, we, we're imagining a classroom now, actually, but increasingly a classroom as we, as we move forward. And what we're thinking is we're going to train children obviously to use technology but then kind of credit questions come up again right uh, like OP if o OP's use of the note cards is just the beginning right next time he may well use his iPhone to connect to a much more sophisticated information store and get a hundred right on his test right and he'll still say it's just like Otto's notebook right you know don't get freaked about it it's part of my extended mind well one response you might have to this is to re reject this on the grounds that somehow we've moved outside the, 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 the limits of what's natural right, for human beings. Here's a nice example. Um, at a certain point in the recent history of swimming, certain uh, swimsuits were used that did really, really well at reducing friction and drag. And swimming's governing body eventually outlawed these swimsuits. And what they said was they wished to recall the main and core principle that swimming is a sport essentially based on the physical performance of the athlete. And I think what they were saying here is that 
What the swimsuits were doing were giving some swimmers an unnatural advantage. Right, that seems to be the argument. So maybe we should say the same thing about education. Right? Opie got an unnatural advantage by having access to his now super notebook system. And I kind of think this is what the Guardian were worried about with technologically enhanced memory. So if that's what you think, we have a clear, clear argument in this case, right? You know, we don't let people take their iPhones into the exam, right? You know, because that will give them an unnatural advantage. And so what we want to test on this view are the, what you might think of, unaided uh, capacities of the naked brain. And that's what education should be. And you can see how this works, right? What we want is people to take that information into their brain. Then they get the credit for it, right? They get the epistemic credit for what they know. But all the time, the information is just out there on the web, and they can just access it using their technology. They don't really know it, because it's not in their brain, and they don't get the credit for it, right? That's why they don't know it. So you can see how all this comes together. Well, not so fast. If what I said earlier on is right, about human beings, borrowing from Andy's natural born cyborgs picture, that human beings are naturally the kind of biological creatures that couple with technology and always have been, right? Sometimes that, you know, technology takes a social form like Savinus's memory slaves, but there's the abacus and, you know, and so on and so forth. So natural isn't equivalent to unaided by technology in this picture. And you might think that where technology couples seamlessly and transparently with and so he's functionally integrated with the learner. Take a teenager's personalised smartphone, for instance, that's seamlessly integrated into their activity. That's what my son's smartphone is like. That might be evidence of an extended mind, and thus of an extended knower. And surely we want to test the learner's mind. Right? We want to test what the learner knows. If the learner is extended, if the knower is extended, that's what we want to test. And that's an argument for allowing the iPhone in. Right? Because that's what, there's a system here that knows, and that's the cognitive system, and it's owned by the individual concerned. So that's what we want to test. They get the credit for it. Well, some people might not, might not like that. That's not an argument for never testing the naked brain, right? You might want to do that. You might have to have lots of subtle exam systems, some of which test the naked brain, because you care about that sometimes, some of which test what coupled technological, biological, organic hybrids can do. And we want to be training our, the, the organic bits of those systems to do it properly, right? So we shouldn't ignore the naked brain, but we need to train that brain to be an effective and flexible component in organic, technological, epistemic assemblages that know stuff. Right? For example, those of you in the room who have children of the right age will no doubt have been driven insane by the fact that your child will sit on the sofa with their headphones in, with their iPad, watching the TV while talking to their mates on social media, trying to hold a conversation with you about what they want for dinner. Right? And people get really annoyed about this. And I've learned not to, right? Because I think this is exactly the kind of skill that you need in the modern world. Data parallel, parallel data handling, right? The organic technological hybrid that is my son and his iPad and his mates, if you like, on social media and everything else that's going on around him at the time in those kind of technologically driven ways. That's a very powerful epistemic assemblage. And the little organic bit in the middle that's my son needs to be able to subtly couple with all those different things. And that's what he needs to be educated to do. So I think parallel real-time information handling is not a source of distraction, but it's a skill. And that includes not only information stored on the web, but also social web phenomena, such as the use of Twitter for fast and reliable crowdsourcing. Right? So whether you go embedded or extended here, you know, the extended view has some quite strong uh, uh, conclusions about what we want to examine. You know, there's an extended knower here. That's, if you like, the metaphysics of the situation. That's what we should be examining. But even if you're embedded, you might think the modern world brings up this, these kind of questions. So here, I think, we go beyond the embedded, extended kind of battle that I've been playing out for the rest of the talk. And we get to a case where, whether we go embedded or extended, which I think has some interesting consequences, this problem comes up anyway. What should we be educating in a world where what we know is so intimately related to the technology around us? I think this can be a massive source of empowerment. Right? Uh, uh, and here I appeal to Tim Berners-Lee's campaign, of course, the, you know, Stanley picked out as the inventor of the web. 
Berners-Lee's been campaigning recently for truly global web access, right? And the reason he's doing that is because what he wants is a situation as follows. Where some country in some deprived part of the world needs to solve, say, an irrigation problem. But what they have to do now is like to fly in the experts from the West. The idea is if we just make sure there's enough web access and enough information on the web, they just solve the problem themselves by learning how to do it from the web. And that's the powering, empowerment side. Of course, that depends on the social distribution of the enhancing technology, right? Uh, and the worry, of course, is that as we get more and more powerful enhancing technology, these organic technological epistemic assemblages that know so much will all end up being in one part of the world, right? And not, in, not distributed in the way that Berners-Lee wants. So I think what we end up with here, when we worry and we think about these issues about knowledge and credit, which sometimes can look just like quite uh, technical philosophical issues, we find that in the end, questions about credit, knowledge in relation to technology, actually have an enormously important role to play in the way we think about education, but also perhaps in the way we think about the kind of challenges that the world will face, uh, not just in this century, but in the centuries beyond. Thanks very much for listening.